Top Bed Talk. Good morning. We are here at the inaugural meeting for EBPOM USA 2018 Master's Course, the Perioperative Care Practicum in Atlanta, Georgia. My name is Desiree Chapel, host of the round table and anchor for Top Med Talk. And I'm joined this morning today by uh, Dr. Brian Woods, anesthesiologist and president for North Star Anesthesia. Dr. Irving Yee, the Regional Chief Medical Officer for North Star Anesthesia, and Elena Kepke, one of our uh, anesthesiologists who is doing her Duke Perioperative uh, Fellowship there. Thank you guys so much for joining us today and, and sitting down. I appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Yeah, I agree. Good morning, hey, Desiree. Uh, do you, I just want to give you guys kind of an opportunity to talk a little bit about your backgrounds, and then we'll kind of dive into some questions that sound great. Irving, I'll start with you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what your uh, training's been? I know we've talked about this, and I think it's really interesting. Sure, sure. So um, I've been all over the country with my training education. I guess uh, at Vanderbilt, I, I go to Vanderbilt in Nashville. Uh, great gratitude for my MD and my MBA, MBA being the best choice of my life because that's where I, my, where I met my wife. <laughs> I did my residency at University of Washington, um, and then afterwards I went out to Stanford for the perioperative fellowship there, the country's first and, and oldest. Um, and since that time, I, I joined North Star Anesthesia, moved uh, to Louisville, um, and uh, now I work, have a great time. I uh, see a lot of different sites and a lot of different, uh, diff- a lot of different challenges, but it's a, it's a, it's a dynamic the dynamic industry and I have a good time facing all those challenges. That's great. I'm sure you're going to have lots of commentary related to the perioperative space. I think that some people, a, a good perspective on that. Um, Elena, can you tell us a little bit about what you've been doing uh, this last year? Sure. Um, uh, well, I came from Tulane um, uh, and I got my MD and MBA there as well. And I trained in UT Southwestern Texas. And this year I'm uh, at Duke uh, specializing in perioperative medicine, um, which is basically a what this whole conference embodies and how to stand up these clinics to improve uh, population health in surgical patients, um, which is quite the opportunity and honestly is mostly untapped uh, in the United States and and everywhere. Um, I find most interesting um, the research behind our business plans. Um, They go hand in hand. We need to know, um, we just talked about anemia clinics, we need to know that outcomes are better to not transfuse, not just costs, and then you need to combine that knowledge and costs to bring it to administrators and to change perioperative medicine as a whole. Yeah. And I think that's really what I'm socializing in this year in terms of anemia or pain or sleep apnea. It's been a great opportunity. Great. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, Brian, can you tell us a little bit about what uh, what you're doing these days with North Star Anesthesia, what your background is there? Certainly. So um, I, I began my medicine career actually in aerospace medicine for the U.S. Air Force. So I spent seven years uh, working uh, with, with lots of great people around the world. And that when I got out of the Air Force in 2003, I went to UT Southwestern, uh, as you did, and uh, was able to finish my anesthesia training there. And when I left that department in uh, 2007, joined North Star Anesthesia, just as a regular anesthesiologist working in the OR, uh, worked at a small facility uh, in Fort Worth, uh, where we did kind of everything from orthotopic livers to high-risk OB, and so really enjoyed kind of getting into a bunch of different angles of anesthesia. Very quickly, our industry uh, started to grow and expand, and our company began to grow and expand, and uh, due to some past experience I had in, in the music industry and with marketing and some other things, I got really involved in the growth and expansion of our businesses. Um, and uh, having a, a little bit of background on that, I don't have an MBA uh, like our, my <laughs> colleagues here, uh, but uh, kind of did the, the real-life struggle part of the world, uh, trying to figure out the finances and how do you get things that have great vision, great purpose, and great outcomes how do you get them funded? How do you get them to where you can actually advance the cause um, that you know is going to do great things for either your people that work with you or for the patients that, in this case, that we're talking about? And so in 2016, uh, I met Monty uh, for the first time, who's obviously uh, very important to this program here. But um, it was the first time that I started to see the uh, coming together of both the Uh, patient care delivery opportunities, the actual science that was available in perioperative medicine. Um, And as we all know now, that's been growing and growing over the years. But uh, I think we've reached a real pinnacle in the history of our space uh, and in the history, in this case, of North American healthcare, to where um, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity. And most of us feel the angst that we know the opportunity is there, but we can't quite get people convinced um, that it's time to take these steps. And uh, 
I'm excited to be here at this inaugural meeting this weekend uh, to reconnect with Monty and to, to reconnect with Saul on some things. But uh, I think there is a true opportunity to take the business case that is present in a, a lot of the data that is there. And uh, what we are hopeful to do at North Star is um, a lot of the things that have been done to date have been done in, in academic centers, sometimes with anesthesia residency programs or other personnel available, or great fellowship programs like they have at Duke uh, that Elena is in. Um, and, and my hope is uh, over this coming uh, next six to nine months is to uh, kind of uh, reassess all of the things that are known and then create a large-scale operational, operational deployable model that we can do uh, across our 153 facilities in North Star Anesthesia. Um, and so uh, it's an exciting time. Uh, there's a lot going on, uh, and we very much look forward to being a big part of all this coming forward. Yeah, that's great. Um, so, you know, the policy session that happened yesterday, there were a lot of takeaways from that. Um, but we've talked a lot about cost versus, you know, is it is it about the money, is it about the patient, and how do, how do we uh, come to (laughs) how do we bring that together um what were some of the things that you kind of took away from that and uh what are your thoughts on that elena it has to go without saying any change you make in healthcare um, should be about the patient first um and when you need to make a change you need to be able to justify it that um, it'll be sustainable and not cost more than what we're doing um and sometimes that uh requires uh speaking to Medicare, Medicaid, um, lobbying and educating them about our changes and what should be reimbursed and what shouldn't. And a lot of times the old standards don't really fit with what makes sense now. And so I think we need to really keep that relationship up to be able to make changes. Irving, kind of on an operational level, like when we're on the ground doing these things, thinking about that, I mean, mean, that's kind of what you're doing right now. Sure. Um, What do you think? The answer is there's no easy answer. <laughs> the reason we're having these conferences and where we are is because of the complexity of, of all the different stakeholders. We talk about the patient. We talk about the providers. We, uh, p- population health. And all that is, well, I think of it as a cost, as from financial constraints, as sort of the, the blanket that sort of mm-hmm. uh, prevents us from doing everything and anything that we do and want to do as clinicians. And that's always been the tension between um, my MBA studies and my MD studies. Um, so when you look at the business side, that has to be, that has to be there, for a number of reasons. Uh, well, there are obvious reasons where you take for the things that you do for for better patient care. But for the most part, any projects and quality initiatives and improvements that you want to make require a certain level of buy-in and um, and financial assistance from administrators, from from leaders within the organization, with within the system. That's that's a minimum because if you don't have that, you can't do can't do anything else. Yeah. And then from there, the operational part is, that is, is developing the process. The evidence is, that is there. Right. You know, there are a lot of things that, that just make sense and needs to be done. And then becomes the hard part where you, where you operationalize that. You, you have to write the protocols. You have to write the processes. You have the leadership to educate everybody from the, from the, the nurses, from the pre-op nurses who, who check someone in all the way up to the surgeons who are really responsible for, for, for post-op orders yeah. and things like that. And you, you've got to touch all those people. Um, and uh, that's challenging because culture yeah. culture is pretty much everything. Yeah. And, and, and change, change, uh, you know, change leadership is essentially culture change. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's, and it's we, we, we know the, the, the challenges in, in the that's culture right. change for sure. Uh, one of the things I think EPOM's doing a great job in addressing these issues is taking the evidence and putting it into practical, you know, practical, a practical approach and um, teaching us how to look at all of that and put it together. Uh, Brian, whenever we were talking about, you know, the, that, that money versus patient, yeah. um, how's North Star kind of addressing that? Well, I, I, it's, uh, it's such a pivotal thing, right? Anytime that you're trying to do change management, uh, the first thing that people will try to read in you is what is your agenda, yeah. right? You're coming to bear news or to make an ask, and the first thing they're going to ask about is what's your agenda. And so I think it's very important for people to not just articulate what they think people want to hear, mm-hmm. but you truly have to believe what it is that you're selling. Yeah. And so for me personally, um, you know, we talk about patient versus money. Um, I, I know that we have to lead with patient, but I also know being an, an executive in healthcare, you can't talk about just patients unless you have the money side figured out as well with the plan. Uh, for me personally, I've gotten to live on both sides of this. I, I'm an executive, do lots of you know, national contracts and, and money, 
But I got to be a patient. Uh, I was in a motor vehicle accident. I've had 31 surgeries. I had $900,000 worth of bills that I shouldn't have had because of the way things went down and the way my care was delivered. Um, I had care at UT Southwestern at Parkland Hospital. I was in bed at SICU 6 for, uh, you know, uh, 36 days. Um, great people. I love them. But I wish some of the things that we know now yeah. about care, about fluid therapy, had been used during the course of my life-saving treatments because many of the complications that I wound up with during my ICU stay, my extended inpatient stay, and then for two years in rehab and getting everything done, most of my care, most of my cost was affiliated with complications that were experienced after the initial surgery. Um, and so for me, it's a very personal passion type thing because I've had to personally go through that. Um, but coming back around to um, if you're going to make the argument, you, you must be able to lead with patient outcomes. Yep. Thank the good Lord there's plenty of data that we can <laughs> sell. So yeah. I think it takes two things. One, we have to have great storytellers. Yep. We have to be able to get people informed. Number two, we must objectify this conversation. You must have data. If you do not have the data, you will not win your arguments. And so that comes in a lot of different forms. One of the things we're doing at Dr. Yee's location is uh, installing a, a preoperative uh, platform that's going to set on top of the Epic HIS there, a uh, hospital information system there, to give us access to data on multiple patients, multiple surgical lines, um, with preoperative assessment and identification of risk factors that we might be able to mitigate preoperatively, immediately postoperatively, or in the transition of care window. Um, and so uh, we must objectify that window and have the data to do that, and then we must make the business case. And then uh, I'm going to highlight a point that I think uh, Monty and I agree on, and he kind of made this point at the end of our session this morning. Um, this almost has to go beyond physicians yeah. and executives in hospitals talking about it. There must be a grassroots education movement for patients. Um, I think there's a lot of ways that we can get to that, and, and certainly with EPOM and other organizations coming together and aligning our interests, uh, I think there are important ways that we must educate the average uh, family member and the average patient in America to know what they should be expecting from their perioperative care. Um, I think people are becoming more and more educated uh, about what that is, but if we could teach them you should ask for this, and you will go home sooner. You should ask for this, and you will have less pain. You should ask for this, and your mother will be able to go back to work. Yeah. Um, those types of things, I think, are going to ultimately be the drivers that allow us to achieve the results we're all seeking, um, is aligning the physicians, aligning the administrators, and then getting the patients to start making the demand. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and that's what I was thinking when you said you were in the hospital, and I wish I would have known this. I wish I would have known that. Um, and you're an educated person. <laughs> you know, there are, right. I mean, not that in, in medicine. Understood. Many, many, uh, most of our patients are not, and they have no idea where to start. A, a question for the fellowship that both of you um, are in and have done. Um, is that part of your training now? How do we reach out to our patients to pre prepare them in a different way and educate them? Is that what you guys are receiving in training um, or anything that you're working on personally? Um, we, I, we did work on that in a couple of our clinics. Um, for example, our perioperative pain clinic that we'll talk about later today. Um, we created a patient education tool, um, not only to show them why uh, being on high doses of opioids led to higher infections and worse outcomes, um, because a patient deserves to know that. Um, we shouldn't be making these decisions at a higher level and not informing them how That's they right. can help themselves. Um, and basically, it walked them through what they should do before surgery, how to make their in-hospital stay and what to expect, um, coping and healing practices, uh, bring eye masks, bring a playlist, and then what to expect um, to set up for their going home. And, um, I mean, that would... It doesn't have to be just pain patients that yeah, have that. Yeah. And I think a lot of our uh, literature we give people is, um, you know, don't shower or don't take that medicine. Um, but it's not about the whole experience and what they should expect. Um, and I think a lot of things we, we have left the patient out on. Um, yeah. We don't give our patients choices. Hey, um, if you came in two weeks earlier, uh, how would you like some iron supplements versus... Uh, blood transfusion, which many mm. people are afraid of, um, mm. you know, we're, we're not giving them that choice. Yeah. Uh, we just have a system that requires us to do, um, honestly, the, the latter um, and transfuse them. Yeah. Right. The, the ph pharmaceutical industry has done a really good job of driving, you know, driving patient education, haven't they? <laughs> they have yeah. a lot of money behind that. How do we as a perioperative group and space 
sure. you know, reach out in that way, Irving, you have any? Yeah, so, so it is very much about empowering the patient as patients want to become more involved and technology has made it such that it's much easier. Um, my fellowship out in Stanford, um, because of its location and in Silicon Valley and the exposure to the different technologies out there, um, you know, so, some of my fellowship was being able uh, to, to not only be exposed to some of the newest technologies and platforms and software that's coming out there, but, but thinking about those innovations and the design of how we touch, how we touch patients um, in how do you design phone calls, automated phone calls? How do you set up the applications that uh, help patients monitor their own statuses? How do you send them reminders, the texts, um, the additional communications? Um, there are a lot of interesting companies out there and a lot of different um, applications that are, that are out there and that are gaining some ground um, that, that I find just very fascinating and really hold the hand and help the patient go from, go from I'm having surgery all the way to recovery. Um, and you know, current software already exists, and that's an example of, of, some, great, of some great technology where the reminders, schedule reminders, um, nutrition reminders, um, communications about frequently asked questions, uh, resources, all that stuff is now becoming more available uh, to the patient. Um, and embracing some of this technology, it's not all about, it's all, not all about the right. app. You, you, know, you do have to make efforts and, and clicks um, and, and things like that, but um, certainly um, utilizing... Uh, the technologies that we have, I think, I yeah. think is, is, a, is a necessary forward thinking it's step. Add, it's adding another tool in our toolbox of That's how right. we actually, you know, take care of our patients as a whole. That's right. Um, Brian, did you have any comments? Well, I just, listening to both those conversations and, and uh, A, I'm first thankful that people of this talent have decided they're going to take an extra year and do the fellowship training to I- extend uh, our opportunity in this space. I think we must multiply that. I think there's going to be a need for quick assessment to how do, how do we create the opportunity like you've had for this year to be done by dozens of people per year so that we can start to make an influence in the, in the space. So uh, I think that's something that we should talk with uh, Ed Palm about and, and get that going. The second thing that's kind of a, a summary thought, um, it, it perplexes me why we know all of these pieces of information. We make jokes amongst ourselves in the anesthesia community about, well, we only get 24 hours to see them or when we have 48 hours to see someone. Why is there not the opportunity to pause for a patient who's going to have preferably less than five surgeries in their lifetime? Why is there such this race to a date? And I think we should be thinking about how do we create the opportunity to educate surgeons and others about what is the rush? There is no difference between, you know, uh, Miss Betty having surgery on Tuesday versus three weeks from now. And if we can make all of these outcomes potentially better, Um, I think we need to start studying the psychology of why is that pause not allowed right now. And I think if we can get that done through technology, through education, or through additional people being trained in fellowships, uh, we should make that a goal. Yeah, absolutely. It's just transitioning for that that, um, change in thinking. I think that's what people are are fearful of as well. So um, final note, yesterday uh, we ended on enhanced recovery. Um, as part of the perioperative model uh, in in North Star right now, what are you? Uh, how are you embracing the enhanced recovery model uh, with yeah. your providers? Um, I'll, let me address that with some of the things that, that I know that are going on around the, the country. One, uh, I, I believe, like many, it's been kind of a slow, struggling start. So uh, you don't think? Do you think that we're at the tipping point when it comes to enhanced recovery? In, I do in the U.S. Yeah, may it okay. be so, um, but I, I do believe that um, in North Star, we've been talking about these concepts, as I said, for about two years. Um, we have sporadic and little pockets of information and 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 protocols that have been deployed um, in the Detroit Medical Center. Uh, Dr. Vinay Palakanda has been very uh, influential in coordinating a lot of work with the surgeons and others up there. Uh, they instituted a new process for orthopedic total joint programs over the last two years, and they have very consistent data with decreased admission, decreased le- uh, length of stay. Uh, one of the most significant cost effectors that they found was the decreased uh, transition to SNF uh, yeah, facilities and absolutely. being able to directly discharge to home. Um, and so that, that study has been uh, very well done and continued on. It wasn't just a short-term trial and, and done. Um, at the, uh, in the Lubbock uh, facilities that we have, we have four hospitals in Lubbock, Texas. Uh, we've been able to institute some of the colorectal pro- protocols there. Um, in uh, uh, Fort Worth, Texas. We're uh, rolling out the uh, Jen and Jen Onk protocols at our Andrews Women's Hospital. So we have good leaders with good cooperation with key surgeons um, in certain pockets of the, the community. But everything I just mentioned, that's only about 11 of our hospitals. We have 153 facilities. And so we're looking for ways to take the, the, 
the known gains possible in this and in the conversations that we talk about in conferences like this and then apply that on scale. Um, if we can do that and start to add to the mass with our over a million cases per year, we believe we'll begin to be, uh, objectify all of our conversations, not just North Star Anesthesia, but all of us in the space. Uh, we'll be able to add to that so we'll have better data to make our arguments. Oh, that's fantastic. I think Did um, you have a comment? Yes. Uh, something I didn't appreciate before this year um, is how standardization um, improves outcomes in general. And you get... Um, a fight um, often not from the surgeons but from anesthesiologists or mm-hmm. CRNAs that um, almost ego driven they they want to perform their art of the anesthetic and what they think is the best um, whereas we kind of need to be shifting to um, making good data data and um, it's shown that when you standardize things um, and the PACU nurses are used to getting one type of patient on this type of drug, outcomes improve, even if it's not the perfect um, right. ERAS protocol. Um, it's easier to analyze, easier to improve, and everyone does better. So I think that's going to require a shift in thinking that's easier in academic centers and yeah. than in private that I've seen. And um, I'm curious how um, the colleagues at Northstar, how you plan to implement that there? Well, that is a huge, huge problem. So uh, well identified. Uh, it really starts with instilling a culture about this is greater than us. Yeah. Well, um, we all we true. all grew up saying there's a million ways to skin a cat. Right. So that's just been ingrained in what we have always learned. So mm-hmm. someone tells us to standardize something. It, right. It's it's right? it's kind of anti-American, yeah. right? <laughs> right. Yeah. I'm supposed to be able to grab my boot and pull it up the way I want to pull my boot up, <laughs> not how you tell me to do that. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that ultimately uh, it requires a culture that's committed to generating great results that are greater than you or your ego. Um, And that has to be led from the top. Um, That has to be emulated from the top. So our top clinicians like Dr. Yi and and Dr. Roberts and Dr. Lumley who are here with us, if you don't have key people in key leadership positions that are setting that pace, setting that tone, and then leading that out, um, it's going to be much more difficult. I said that like it's really, really easy if you just do that. It's absolutely not, right? It's the Even hardest it, thing ever. I'm sitting here thinking through the 11 different physician names I know in, in Dr. Yu's, uh, you know, hometown of Louisville, Kentucky. Um, there will be challenges there, uh, but those challenges should not dissuade us from the pursuit. And to your exact point, we don't have to seek perfection. We just need to be present, and we need to be doing things in a consistent manner. Only then, with objective data, can we start to measure and to figure out how we can make that better. Yeah, absolutely. Well, gentlemen and Elena, thank you so much for joining us thank this you. morning thank at you. EBPOM 2018. It's an honor. A, yes, thank you. It was a great conversation. Um, be sure to follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram at Top Med Talk for daily updates of the conference here in Atlanta and, and the live stream and the discussions that we're having with participants and speakers here. You can also find the podcast on our website at topmedtalk.com. And please subscribe on your podcaster to Top Med Talk as well. Thank you. We'll, we'll catch you guys later. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Top Med Talk.